and welcome to Virtual College Camp. My name is Morgan Anderson and I'm one of the College Outreach Coordinators here at Mid-State Technical College. Today you'll have the opportunity to win this summer basket as you participate in our videos throughout the day. Have a parent or guardian send a picture of you participating to recruitment at mstc.edu. Good morning and welcome to Virtual College Camp 2020. My name is Paul Bushmaker and I'm one of the instructors here in the Criminal Justice Department at Mid-State Technical College. I'm Mike Topness and I'm the other Criminal Justice Instructor at Mid-State Technical College. We're excited to be a part of your summer. I wish we could be in person, but we're going to do it virtually this year. What we're going to demonstrate and do today is part of the obstacle course that's required to get into the Law Enforcement Recruit Academy to be a police officer in the state of Wisconsin. So both Mike and I are former police officers and now here at the college, we teach the future police officers like all of you. So we're going to go through and demonstrate the obstacle course today, and then we're going to have a little race at the end that you can set up in your yard using anything. We're obviously in a gymnasium, and we have cones, but it's summer and it's beautiful, so you can use your yard, and you can use soup cans or soda bottles or buckets or whatever that you have lying around the garage or the house. So let's go ahead and demonstrate what we're going to do here today as part of our uh, obstacle course in the agility room. This is the layout for the obstacle course. This obstacle course is actually the, uh, one of the requirements to get uh, access into the academy. Uh, you can do this with anything you want at home. We have cones, obviously. To set this up, it's, you need 30 feet of uh, clear space overall. You're going to put one item right on, the, right on the start line, and then every 10 feet, put one more item for a total of 30 feet. Um, Paul is going to go through the entire thing. We're going to start with push-ups first, and he's just going to explain and demonstrate uh, briefly how to do a proper push-up. We're going to start the agility run with 10 push-ups. Okay? So you want to start at the zero, or your start line, and with your feet up and your hands at shoulder width apart, and a straight back, okay? A standard push-up, you're just going to go down. You're going to keep your elbows going back until your chest is almost touching the ground but not quite. And then you're going to push back up at one. If you need to, you can do a modified push-up and drop your knees to the ground and still come down with your elbows going straight back, coming down to your chest almost touching the ground, and then push back up. You don't want to have your hands way out here and you don't want your elbows going out sideways. You want your elbows in and you come right straight back and push back up. And you're going to do that for 10 push-ups. Okay, and then you're going to get up and you're going to come down and you're going to run the 30 feet down to this end, step over the end of your 30 feet and come back to the cone where you started and you're going to make a left turn. Now you're going to run between your items that you have spread out, your suit pants, your solar bottles, your buckets, and then you're going to make a right turn around the cone going to serpentine back through your items. You're going to make a left turn. You're going to come all the way out to the end. Get past your last cone, and you're going to sprint to the finish. And that's the agility run right there. All right, a couple key things to remember if you're going to do this with a partner is to maintain your six-foot social distancing, right, during our, our COVID uh, spell here. What we're going to do, Mike and I are going to race. And we're going to go through the agility course. We're going to start with 10 push-ups and go through the course. Only since this is law enforcement, our finish line is this box of glazers here. Okay? So the end of the race is going to be whoever finishes one donut first. On your mark, get set, go! All right, as you can see, it's not always about being the fastest or could do the most push-ups the quickest. It's about who can chew the fastest. So while we had a great time in our agility run, um, and you can see that Mike can really chew fast, 
We want to make sure that you're safe while you're doing this. So maintain your six foot spacing, set up your area where you're not going to slip or fall or trip. Um, we have a clean gym floor surface here. Make sure that your parents are, are supervising and know what you're doing. The food is obviously optional. But just always remember to be safe um, and be careful and have fun. campers. My name is Stacy Brock and I'm one of the full-time cosmetology instructors at Minstate Technical College. Today I'm going to have you explore with me how to do a mermaid makeup from the supplies and tools that you have at home. When you're finished watching this video you'll be able to create the same look with all your supplies that you have at home. So let's get started. So the first step today I am going to be starting on her eyelid. I'm going to be putting a base down. I'm going to be using a cream that's skin colored. And I think I'm going to go with blues and greens today. Uh, you can use any color that you have at home that's bright, anything that you like. But I'm going to start right on her crease on her eyelid. I'm only going to go from here to here. And I'm going to use this cream base color. Now that I'm done with that step, I'm going to actually go into my blues. I have a palette here. I'm going to start with the darkest blue that I have, and I am going to use a brush that's a little bit smaller, kind of a pencil brush, for the crease. This is going to be the darkest part that we want. And one thing about mermaid makeup is that we want it very bold, very strong. It doesn't really have to, has to have some type of blend, but you do want a little bit of a line that has that transition. So I'm going to go ahead again and put my darkest blue, because I'm going to use blue and greens today, and I'm going to put it right in the crease line. Okay, now that I'm finished with that step, if you look a little bit closer, you'll see that I had put some pressing powder on her cheeks because as I put this dark blue or whatever color that you have, you might have what's called fallout that will come out of your brush. It will go onto the rest of the skin and that will make the skin darker. This way, if you do have fallout, when we're all done, we can just brush that powder off and it should just come right off and it won't affect the look at all. So as you can see, I have her blue on, but you can see it's not really blended very well. So now I'm just going to take some time to go in and blend that. And it takes a little bit of time, but I am going to use a blender brush, which is a little bit puffier. And as I go in, I'm going to do like windshield wiper strokes back and forth. I'm going to hold it towards the end of the brush. That way, uh, if I hold it closer, it's firmer and then it's harder for it to actually uh, blend in. So I'm going to use it on the very end and then I'm going to go through and make sure I blend all of that through. Once it's blended through, I'm going to come in with a little bit lighter blue. I'm going to go above this and try to fade that in up to the brow line. So that's the next step that I'm going to do. Okay, I'm done with that part. It gets pretty hard to blend, um, especially when you have that bold of colors. So as I keep going, I'm going to continue to blend that. I also took some white and like I said before, I put it up to the brow bone. Um, I'm now going to go in with a little bit of glitter and put it just on the lid because I want it to sparkle just a little bit and we're going to add some gems to her face so we want it to all kind of tie together. So I'm going to go through just on the lid and you can use whatever color uh, that you feel is best if it's rainbow or I'm going to go with some greens and blues again. Okay. Okay now we're finished with the eyelids and all the way up to the brow bone and I'm gonna go underneath and I'm just gonna put a, a layer of blue or green, whatever color you would like, with the finest brush that you have. And the glitter you can put on with multiple things. You can put on with your pencil brush, you can put on with the, the blender brush, or even I have a glitter stick that has got a little end on it, kind of like a mascara wand um, that you could use. So any of those would work. And then you kind of want to let it dry just a little bit so that it blends very well and that you don't smudge it all over. So I'm going to do the, uh, the underneath and then we'll get started on the rest of her face. Okay, now we're ready to get started on the rest of her face. We want to create some scales. So you can either go in her cheek line or around her hairline, even on her jawline. Um, you can start out by giving her some contouring because you want to make it look like she's got kind of a structure to her face. 
So prior to me actually putting on this net and I uh, on the supply list, I think you guys have a net of some sort. This is just an onion bag net that I'm using and it works really well. So it does not matter. Um, bigger the holes, bigger the scales. That's the only difference. So before I use this, I'm going to go ahead and do some contouring on her face and then I'm going to put this on uh, in the next step. So first thing I'm going to do is contour. Okay, we're ready for the next step. You can see that I contoured here and here and here. So the next thing that you're going to need to do is you are just going to place this over the head and wherever you're going to start creating the scales, you want to make sure that this bag does not move. So as I start here, I'm going to hang on to it. I'll hang on to it here, here, and here. And when I go in, I am going to use a little bigger blender brush. I'm going to start with my dark and I'm going to tap, tap, and I'm just going to kind of keep tapping. I'm going to make sure this does not move because if it moves, it will not show up the scales, okay? So the darker the color, the more uh, the more pop your scales will have. So if you have a black, that would even work, especially if you have a yellow or something like that. Uh, so I'm going to go through and put her scales on and then we'll move on. Okay, so we're done with that part, creating the scales. Uh, now I'm going to go through and put some eyelashes on her. You guys obviously already have some, so now would be the time. If you want to put false eyelashes on or if you want to put mascara on, this would be the time to do that. So I'm going to put her eyelashes on and then we'll go on to the jewels. Okay, I have her eyelashes on. I'm going to go in and put some jewels on just on the corner of her eyes. You could put them on her forehead, you could bring them down, wherever you would like. And then I'm also going to go ahead and put some blue on her lips. And that will probably complete our look. So I'm going to go ahead and put those on. You can use um, eyelash adhesive to put the jewels on and um, just a little bit is all you need. And if you don't have any jewels, that's okay. Glitter, whatever works. So I'm going to go ahead and put those on. Okay, so I just got done putting some jewels on the side of her face. You can put in as many as you want. And this completes our look. And I also put some blue on her lips with a little bit of glitter. I hope you had a good time watching today and I hope you will be able to do this look yourself at home. Enjoy and have a great time. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Keith Moen. I'm a paramedic instructor with Mid-State Technical College. And we're here today to talk through our paramedic and EMT programs and what Miss State Technical College has to offer for you. This is my friend Dalton. He's here to help us I... out. We can take you from zero to hero with no medical training right out of school and within two years get all the necessary certifications to be a paramedic and start your career on fire departments, ambulances, and we could even have you come back in the middle of your career and do things like the critical care paramedic class where you would learn how to be a flight paramedic and work on a helicopter or an airplane. All of these programs are offered through Mid-State Technical College. But you know what? You don't have to wait until you're graduated in order to start being a hero. Paramedics don't do this job alone. And we need the help of the public in order to have a bigger success. And one of those things that we need help with is CPR. If CPR is not established before we get there, it becomes very difficult for paramedics to try to bring somebody back. The sheer act of doing chest compressions can keep somebody oxygenated and, and oxygen going to their brain and keeping their brain alive even though their heart isn't beating on its own. And then when we get there as paramedics with the defibrillators and the medications, that gives us a fighting chance to help that patient. And again, we can't do it without you because that's the most important key. So we're gonna talk through some tricks and tips in order for you to be able to help us help your family members. So let's talk through this. The first thing we wanna do when we come in a room and we find somebody that's gone unresponsive is we want to check and see if they're awake and you give them a little shake and a shout out and go ahead and say are you okay are you okay just like that 
if there's no response and they're not answering you, the next step is one of the most vital steps. You got to get the help coming toward you. So we want you to be able to call 911 and ask them for help. And all you need to do is know where you're at and they're going to be able to send some of those resources for you. So let's show you how that works. Dalton, call 911 for me. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, my mom's not... My mom's not awake and she looks, uh, she looks blue. Okay, what's your address? One, two, three... Lane, Lane Street. Okay, an ambulance is on the way. Can you put your ear to your mom's mouth and listen for her breathing? She's not Do you hear or feel anything? Do you feel nothing? Okay. Do you see her chest moving up and down? No. Okay. All right. Well, we need to start CPR. And that's what you'll hear when you call 911. They're going to ask you, what's your emergency? Tell them, I found my mom and I can't wake her up. She looks blue. She doesn't look like she's breathing. And they're going to walk you through some steps. And then they're going to ask you to start doing CPR. And this is the key. So let's work our way through how do we do CPR. Walton, can you get in position for us to show us how to do CPR? You want to have your hands like this on a person's chest. It might be a little bit weird, but... And you're going right in the middle of the chest, right in the middle of the breastbone. And you put the palm of your hand on the breastbone. And then you start to do what we call compressions. So Dalton, go ahead and start compressions. Now the key to compressions is that you push hard and you push fast. So when we push hard and we push fast, that comes out to about 110 beats per minute. And as you can see, Dalton, it's pretty hard to do, isn't it? And he doesn't really have the rate or the rhythm down. So we've got a little trick that we can use to help you with that. And anytime you want to do something better as a human being, we do it to music. And we've got a song that can help you keep 110 beats per minute. And it's called Baby Shark. <laughs> so Dalton, get in the position of doing CPR. Good, arms locked, shoulders straight over the chest. Good, and we're gonna start doing compressions to Baby Shark. All right, let's keep the beat. And every time you feel the beat, you press all the way down and push all the way to the floor as hard as you can. Baby shark, do 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 baby shark, do 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 baby shark. Mommy shark, do 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 mommy shark, do 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 mommy shark, do 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 mommy shark. Daddy shark, do 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 daddy shark, do 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 daddy shark, do 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 daddy shark. You keep going for us, all right? So when we do Baby Shark, we do 110 beats per minute. And again, you want to push as hard as you can. You want that chest to go all the way to the floor with the whole rhythm of the song. Go ahead and stop, Dalton. Thank you very much. It's funny. It is. But that song is exactly what we need to do in order to save another person's life. So keep that in mind. And the steps to review are one, identify that there's a problem. Two, do not hesitate calling 911. Get help coming towards you. And then three, you're going to do CPR. You're going to do chest compressions to the tune of Baby Shark, which is 110 beats per minute. You're going to push that chest as hard as you can, and you don't stop until the paramedics get there. And if you end the song, you might need to go to extended family. So you could do baby shark, mama shark, daddy shark, cousin shark, second cousin shark, whatever you need to. But don't stop until those paramedics get there. Again, my name is Keith Melvin. And I'm Dalton. And this is Dalton. And we're with Mid-State Technical College. And keep us in mind, when you're thinking about becoming a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, we have all of your health protective services needs wrapped up in one area of the college. Thank you, have a good day. Bye. Hello everyone, I'm Paul
Paul Kennedy and welcome to summer camp. I'm the hospitality management instructor here at Mid-State Technical College. Part of what I get to do is, uh, you know, enjoy working with people and working with food. So today I'm going to show you how to make a little special summer treat here. We have some candy sushi. So we got some simple ingredients to do this. We got some Rice Krispie treats. You can make these yourself very easily or you can uh, buy the pre-purchased ones like I have here. These a little quicker and a little more sanitary at times. We have some fruit roll-ups. We have some fruit by the foot, which we'll be using here. We have some Swedish fish. We have some licorice. Okay. Also have a little bit of nonstick parchment paper and a cutting board to display our items on. So let's get started with this demonstration. First one I'm going to show you is how to make sushi roll around the out with the rice around the outside of it. Okay. And really, it, the sushi is actually the rice. It's not the fish as we think of it here. The fish is actually called sashimi. So I'm going to take my Rice Krispie Treat, starting in the center, I'm going to work its way out to the edges, and I'm going to flatten that out. You want this one to be pretty flat because this is going to roll up on the exterior here. So, hope you guys are having a great summer. Roll this down, put this on our non-stick parchment paper. And we have our, what's called fruit leather. You may know this as fruit roll-ups. We put that in the center. Press that down, try to get that to adhere to our Rice Krispie Treat. Twizzlers. Stretch that out, make sure that's the right length. Some Swedish fish. the red and the green one on the inside here. And now we'll roll this up. Take our non-stick parchment paper and start to roll this. If you're making regular su sushi rolls, this would be, you would use a bamboo rolling mat. And your fruit leather would actually be a product called nori. nice and tight now. Got that rolled. Have a little fruit by the foot here. Take this out. One Swedish fish. Take our Swedish fish. Roll that underneath. And there you have an inside out sushi roll. Now to prepare a more traditional looking one, we'll take our fruit by the foot, our fruit roll up. Stretch it out here. Lay that down flat. Take our Rice Krispie Treat, flatten it out once again. You want that to be nice and flat, pretty thin, so it covers the most of the surface of the roll there. So, give you a close up of how thin that's looking, huh? There we go. Place that on top of the fruit roll-up. Twizzler again, because I like Twizzlers. And we're going to use a couple of green fish this time. Green Swedish fish. And roll that up. Tuck in those ends. Roll that up on that paper, nice and tight again. A couple little garnishes on top here. Or no little garnishes. Yeah. 
and then you have another form of, of candy sushi. So I hope you guys are having a great summer, having a lot of fun. Again, I'm Paul Kennedy with the Hospitality Management Program. Please stay safe out there. Remember to keep your distance from folks and uh, have a great summer. We look forward to seeing you here at Mid-State Technical College soon. I'm Aaron Wolk, one of the instructors for the welding program here at Mid-State Technical College. Uh, and I'm gonna be doing a preview for next year's college camp. And we are gonna be making an octopus out of silverware. So we are gonna start with two forks, two spoons, and we're gonna make that. So the welding process I'm gonna be using today is called gas tungsten arc welding. Uh, it's a really clean process. You can do a real um, fine weld pins with it, clean welds with it. Um, so we're going to do that. I'll go through the process that I did to get to this point. So this is a Beverly shear. This is what I'm going to use to snip the stems off the spoons. And I want to try to get it as close to the, the end of the oval as possible. That way there's less uh, filing I have to do to get, to get it rounded off. So I'm just going to stick it in here, get it as close as I can. So now I have minimal work I have to do to try to get that rounded off. Just a couple swipes of the file and I'll be good. Alright, so now that we have our pieces cut, we're going to start assembling them. And as you can see on the prop, we're going to use the forks for our legs or tentacles. So I'm going to take these and weld them to the inside of the spoon. And I'm just going to do what's called a tack weld. It's just a small little weld just to hold everything together. So I'm going to do that. I got that one on. I'm going to put my second set of legs on because an octopus has eight tentacles. Now I got my legs all jacked in, I'm going to put the other half of the body on and then I'll probably weld some eyes on it, maybe a mouth, and then I can configure my tentacles so it can stand up. So I'll do that.
So I'm gonna weld uh, some eyes. I'll probably put a mouth on there to make it a happy octopus. <laughs> Alright, so now all I have to do is, is bend my legs around and get it so it can stand properly, and then we'll have a pair of octopi. My name is Mike Schultz. I teach the Industrial Mechanical Technician program here at Miss State Technical College. So we do a lot of technical things every day. We learn how to fix it and uh, maintain industrial machinery. So anything that's made in the factory, factory, my students learn how to fix those machines and keep them running well. So because of that, I have the need sometimes to do something creative. So I thought I'd share with you a project you can do at home. Um, it's fairly inexpensive and you should probably have most of the things you need to do it. So we're going to make garden stones and I have some examples in front of me. Um, and uh, so some of the simpler ones are, these are my son's foot impressions back in 2005. So now my sons are, one's finishing up his freshman year and one's finishing his junior year. And these are my sons. So this is my youngest son and this is my oldest son back in 2005 and um, and so we did their footstones and their faces um, then I have some that might be recognizable to you this is crazy horse um, this is Betty Boop who was actually the, uh, the person who invented her I guess is from this area so that's kind of topical and then uh, John Wayne um, and this one is I don't know if you can tell it's like a father and son holding hands um, and all of these photos uh, well these I found on the internet on Google images my sons I took a photo that really captured who they were at the time and cut that out to make the, uh, the negative or the image that uh, was put on the stone. We're going to do something kind of like that, but a lot sim a lot simpler. So, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a turtle. Um, and we'll use the same process I used for these stones, uh, but it's going to be a lot more manageable for you at home the first time. If you are successful with this, um, you might want to try something tougher, like some of these. So, um, we'll go ahead and... Uh, move over to uh, where I'm going to do the work and we'll get started.
Okay, so first I want to run through the things you'll need to do the project. Um, an old board of some kind, I have a, a just a piece of plywood here um, that's big enough that the stone could sit on. You don't want to be doing this on the kitchen table, something like that. Outside on the picnic table, um, somewhere like that is, is ideal. Uh, a garbage bag I'm going to put over the top of it uh, and it keeps the moisture in the, the concrete of the stone um, when we pour it. Uh, you'll need something to mix the concrete with. I just have a simple garden trowel and a putty knife. Those work really well. Um, so something to cut out your pattern with. So what I did for a pattern is I just went on Google Images and I said turtle silhouette. And I found one that I liked and this is it. This is my turtle silhouette. And um, I have to cut away, had to cut away all the white parts. So this is what I do. Here's the outside of our turtle. Here's the all the black parts and that's what's going to be black at the end if i lay this on top of the stone you can see how that fits on there and then all the little parts i put in an envelope because i didn't want to lose them that we'll need these so i'm saving them so that's a pattern um and i have to you to cut it out i use this little knife set you can use a regular utility knife like this these you can see have a bunch of different blades and a handle and it makes it easier you could use a utility knife as well, um, and it'll work just fine. A new blade is gonna work best for you if you use that. So those are some of the tools we'll need. Um, the concrete can get dusty, so everyone has a mask these days. So uh, a mask, just so we're not breathing that concrete dust. And it can also really dry your skin, so you don't wanna be handling it with bare hands. So I have a pair of gloves, and most people have those these days. So uh, I'll just use them when I'm making the stone. And then we have some uh, concrete. What I have is, you can see this, it's called sand popping mix. You don't want to use regular quick creep concrete because it's got bigger pieces of gravel in it and it makes this harder to do. The gravel is called aggregate and concrete is made up of three things. It's made up of sand, aggregate, which is the, the gravel that's in it, and Portland cement. And cement is the part that kind of helps it all stick together. Um, and so we can get a pre-mixed bag of this for like seven bucks at Home Depot. It's, it's rather inexpensive. It's 60 pounds. Uh, I've made three stones out of the bag and I've got enough probably for three or four more stones. So plenty of, plenty of concrete in the bag to make a few. Um, I'll set this aside for just a second. We need a bucket to mix the concrete in, so just a five gallon pail um, to mix the concrete in, an old five gallon pail, and we need a mold. So I'm almost done making my mold, um, and I'm gonna use the top of a pail for that mold, and I left the saw in there, I've almost cut through, I'll finish it for you. Um, but what's nice about a five gallon pail, it's got these ridges on it, and so that's a guide for where we're going to cut. We don't have to measure anything or whatever. And I've just used my hand saw and I'll finish cutting through uh, the top so I can get this done. It doesn't hurt to have someone help you hold it, but... Um, there. So obviously I had to cut all the way around. And the nice thing is I can use this bucket to mix the concrete in, so it's not wasted. So, this is my mold. Um, and again, it sits on this board that I'm gonna pour it in. Uh, and so I guess we'll get started with the uh, steps on making the stove. Okay, <coughs> excuse me, we're ready to get started. Uh, we have to measure out the amount of concrete we need. So I'm going to take my trowel and I'm just going to fill my mold with dry concrete things. In fact, I can just pour some in now. When the bag is full, you'll have to scoop it out. Oh, this is a good place to put on our mask. It does get dusty. And so for this part, we're going to want to wear a mask.
go. bit more. Okay, so we want to overfill, take my mask down for a second, we want to overfill that mold a little bit because when we add the water, the concrete actually kind of compacts together. So you can see it's kind of heaping over the top just a little bit and that will be plenty. So put my mask back on and I'm going to pour this in the pail. Um, this is where the uh, garbage bag comes in really handy. Put my pail here. You see that? I'm just going to tuck all my concrete up in the bag. Put it down in the pail. Put my mask up. There we go. So it's really neat and clean. I can take my mask off now. It's really neat and clean, um, and we won't make too much of a mess. Okay, so I've got dry, dry concrete in the pail. Uh, when I wet it, I want to wear my gloves, because that's when it starts to get to where it can dry out your skin. When you're all done and you wash up, you might want to put some lotion on something like that because your skin probably feel kind of dry. I've got some water here, the magic of water, and water is all we need. And I'm going to pour a little bit in. So this is a two quart pitcher. It's half full. I'm not going to use that much, that half a pitcher of water. Uh, so I add a little bit, maybe about a third of what I have in here. And I'm going to start mixing it up. We don't want it too wet and it can't be too dry. So, see if I can do this maybe so you can see it. I'm doing it left handed, it's pretty challenging. Okay, so it's kind of dry and clumpy and you can even see some of the powder left. That's obviously too dry. So I'm gonna add a little bit of water. Not much, that was like a half a cup maybe. I'm gonna have to stir it with my right hand. Mixing is pretty important. You want all the ingredients, all the stuff to come together. And now, if you look at it, it kind of looks like wet beach sand, something like that. Um, that's the consistency we're looking for. If it gets too soupy, it's going to be really hard to work with. It runs everywhere. Water comes up to the top. So this is this is pretty good. That's what we got. So next step: take our mold. Now, when we cut this off the top of the bucket, you'll notice that buckets are wider at the top and narrower at the bottom. So we actually want the top of the bucket to be the bottom of the mold. So when we lift it off, because it was wider, it comes off the mold easier. So I'm gonna put what was the top down against my plastic, and I'm just gonna put all that concrete right in the mold. Somehow that's very satisfying. See that comes dumping out of there. Okay. You can push that down in the mold. I got my gloves on so my hands aren't gonna get nasty or messy. Okay, so that's in there. Now I have to smooth it off a little bit. That's where the putty knife comes in. So you look at the top, you'll see as I drag that knife over the top, it becomes smoother and smoother. Okay. 
It'll get kind of glossy, wet on the top. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you do want it as smooth as you can make it. So uh, take your time. This is a step that you might want to take a little time doing to get it smooth. Try to get it level or even all the way across. I had a low spot over here, so I'm just kind of pushing it over there in the mold. Okay. So there's a few little stripes and things in there. That's not going to make a difference now because we're going to uh, put the paper on top and that'll actually help smooth things up. First part I'm going to do is put the, um, the outside of the pattern on top and try to get it as even as I can because once it gets wet, it's going to want to stay down on concrete. You can pick it up and pull it a little bit, move it around um, right away. Okay, we want to get the edges to stick. That's important. So run your finger just lightly around the edge, and you'll see the paper will get wet and it'll stick to that concrete. Okay, so the edges are stuck, um, and our mold is in there. Now, I'm gonna take this part that I cut out. Uh, this is just a guide for me to place the little pieces in. I'm gonna put that right where, kind of right where it goes in the mold. It doesn't have to be perfect, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna worry about sticking this down because I'm gonna take it off in a minute. I'm gonna take all my little pieces out of the envelope. And I got a tweezers to help me if I need it. And one at a time, I'm going to put them in the holes that I cut them out of. So this is a little tedious. While I'm doing it, I may as well tell you a little bit about concrete. So um, concrete, like I said, is made out of three things. Uh, Portland cement, an aggregate, like a gravel, and sand. So um, concrete's been used for a long time. In fact, the Romans used it extensively um, in buildings like the Colosseum in Rome, uh, the Great Roman Road, things like that. And those things are still in existence today, which is really cool. That's thousands of years um, that that concrete is held up. One of the reasons that it did hold up so well is because of the type of Portland cement that they used. They got it from volcanic ash, and so there's this volcanic crater called the Pozzolana Crater in Italy somewhere. And um, from, a, from the Pozzolana volcano, and the ash from that is what they use for Portland cement, for the cement that they used. What's really cool about that ash is that um, just because of the way the rocks burned and became ash when the volcano erupted, it has like uh, the fibers in the ash are like little fish hooks that hook together. And so it stays really strong and that's why that concrete has lasted so many years. Now the Romans didn't know that, that that's why. It just happened to be kind of a lucky coincidence that that happened. So what we do these days is put uh, fiberglass fibers in our concrete that do kind of the same thing, that make it stronger. Um, like when they pour a driveway or a road, They'll put some fiberglass fibers in that, and it acts kind of like those hooks that hold everything together and make it stronger. Okay, so I'm almost done here putting the, um, the pieces in. Now, I'm going to take this carefully away. And that just, we're done with it. And I'm going to go back and make sure all of these little pieces are stuck down. Okay. So I can't touch this for like 24 hours. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, 
Luckily, I made one of these yesterday that I'll show you how to, that we can finish the stone. So if you give me just a minute, I'll switch things around and I'll show you. Okay, so we're back and we poured our stone and we put the paper on it and um, we took away the, uh, all the black parts. That's what we want to, um, to paint now. And it's a day later and I can touch this concrete. It's not perfectly cured. Concrete takes um, about 28 days to be perfectly cured. So if you're gonna walk on your garden stone, don't walk on it for a month. However, you can handle it and it's okay now. It just gets stronger every single day. So uh, what we're gonna do is, before we take this apart, we're gonna paint it. So I have some spray paint here. This is just uh, paint and primer together. You can use whatever you want. If you wanna uh, make your stone a color, use colored spray paint, that's fine. I'm just using black. Um, about spray paint, if you ever read the directions, there's a lot of directions on the back of the can. One thing they say is shake it for about a minute before you use it. So when the ball starts to rattle in the can, we want to shake that for about a minute. I've already pre-shaken this a little bit before we went on camera, so I'm not going to shake it that long. Just want to make sure it's mixed. Okay, so I'm going to paint the top of the stone. And um, if you've never spray painted before, one of the big mistakes of spray painting is to try to spray real heavy in one spot. So just on the board here, I'm going to do that. You see how it gets all runny and stuff? It's it's gonna not work really well. So we wanna use um, really quick strokes of the paint over the stone. And so I'll just start painting the top here. And the paint goes on when I push the button down and stops when I take my finger off the button on the top. Okay, so um, normally I would put on oh, maybe three or four coats of paint to get the, the shiny look that this stone has. Um, you can use flat paint too, it doesn't have to be glossy or shiny. Um, but I'll just do the one coat for this and if um, I want to I can go back with some hand paint and paint it later. So this is where my tweezers comes in to start pulling off the parts that I don't want to be there. Um, so, all those pieces of paper, I just pull them away. And if we're really lucky, we are left with a turtle in the end. So, or whatever you want to do. Um, like the stones I showed you earlier, uh, if you want to try something a little more fancy, go ahead, but I think it'll be better for you uh, to try something a little more simple. It doesn't have to be a turtle, it could be a race car, um, it could be whatever you want, it doesn't have to be an animal either. Um, just anything that you kind of like. As the concrete cures, because it doesn't really dry, um, concrete, there's a chemical reaction when we pour the water in there, and that's what makes it get hard. It's not really drying. It's uh, curing and getting harder. So as the concrete cures, um, the grays will get grayer, and the, the black stuff on the edges will fade a little bit. And I think I've got everything from the middle. Um, I'm going to take the paper off the outside. and I can take the mold off now. So I'm gonna push down with my thumbs and pull up on the sides real gently. Because again, this concrete isn't really strong right now. Actually pretty weak. Okay, so that's my mold. That's my turtle. And um, in another day, I'll wait another day. I can move it on the board. If I move it now, I'm afraid it might break. It's pretty soft. Uh, so that's it. Um, when you're done, we do want to clean up our tools. There's a lot of 
concrete on there. If we don't get it while it's still moist, it's going to harden on there. And then our tools um, will have that on, and then they're no good to us anymore, right? So um, I filled up my water pitcher. I'm going to pour it in my bucket. Then I mix the concrete in, and so that'll help me clean the bucket as well. And then just get your tools down in there and swish them off. You can take them at home to the garden hose as well. Um, get the concrete off like that, and then I will take them to like the hose to rinse them for a final rinse. I'll do that with my putty knife that I use to smooth the concrete as well. And the last thing is the bucket itself. I probably should have kept my gloves on for this portion, but you can see I took them off and they're full of garbage. And so I'm gonna just wash my hands really good when I'm done cleaning up. So I'm just gonna swish this around. Try to get it so you can see all the stuff that's on the side of the bucket. I'm just swishing it around in there, getting it off the sides and the bottom. Once I do that, um, I can take this and dump it. You want to dump it in a gravelly spot maybe, or um, something like that. You don't want to dump it uh, on a blacktop driveway. You don't want to dump it down the sink. It will clog your drains, like you know, harden concrete in your drains. So you dump it out, swish it out with the hose, everything's clean, and uh, you throw all your bits and pieces away and you're done. Okay, so once you've swished it all around, you're gonna go dump it out somewhere in a uh, gravelly spot or um, somewhere that the grass doesn't grow, it doesn't really matter, don't dump it on the driveway because you'll leave that kind of a concrete stain thing like there. Anyway, you dump it out, then you go back to the hose, swish it all out, rinse your tools off with the hose, and you're done. campus at Mid-State Technical College and I am here today to share with you a short tutorial on how I like to regrow some of the most commonly used vegetables in my kitchen and those three vegetables are green onions a bunch of green onions right here and then we have celery and we have green leaf lettuce so we use these quite often in our sandwiches and our normal cooking, but we also have two guinea pigs who really enjoy their fresh vegetables every day. Um, it's really fun to watch these vegetables grow every day and know that we can regrow some of them. So the supplies that you will need today are toothpicks, a shallow dish or cup. These are just plastic cups that I just got at the store, so you can grab these anywhere. You will need a sturdy cutting surface as well as a knife. So if you are using a knife, please be careful with it um, or have a parent or guardian help you with that. Um, and you will need some water. So I'm right next to a sink here, so I will be using that. Okay, so the first vegetable that we are going to cover today is the green onion. So you can use the green onion all the way down until you stop. So some people like to stop before it turns white. I like to, you know, right about here. Um, I've already used some of these, but for the purposes of this, I will chop these off and probably dry them or just use them in cooking. So I like to go right about where the, it starts to turn green to cut these off. I will keep the band on there. That's up to you if you'd like to or not, but this band just keeps them in a nice bunch like this so they don't fall apart. So I will take this bunch, I will take my knife carefully, and I will cut right where the green meets the white. So again, I'll use these, dry them, whatever, um, for future purposes. So now I have my short green onion that I plan to regrow, and I will take my toothpicks, and I choose not to put them in the green onion, I just kind of squeeze them in between. So I'll put three toothpicks in there, kind of in a triangle pattern. And then I have my cup. So I put this in my cup. Now these roots on the bottom will grow and it may push it out of the cup and that's completely fine. 
That's just, that just means that it's growing. So I will put water in here. And that's about all we need. Now you can fill this up a little ways. Um, it's not a problem at all, but this is ready to go on the windowsill um, in nice sunlight. Not quite outside yet, it's still a little cold, um, but your green onion is ready to grow. And in about a week to 10 days, that's what you will get. Now green onions are really good at continuing to grow, so these I can just cut off this new growth, this darker green piece here, and just use this, and I change the water once every day or two days, and these grow really well. Our next uh, vegetable that we will cover is celery. Um, so again, we use celery quite a bit. Some people like us, we chop it off as we go, whereas others will peel. Um, it's fine either way, as long as you leave the heart in here intact and this root base intact. If you peel it away and the root base is not there anymore, unfortunately it won't have anywhere to suck up the nutrients, so uh, make sure that this base is intact. So. Just like the green onion, we will cut this down to a more manageable uh, size. So I cut it three to four inches. Um, it's pretty forgiving, so just make sure that you're safe with your cutting. There we go. And again, we'll feed these to our guinea pigs or put some peanut butter on them, and we'll be using that. So now I have a nice manageable size here. Now, one thing with the celery that's different than the green leaf lettuce and the green onions is I like to take a little bit off the base here just to make sure that um, we have a nice healthy um, root here to, to go into the water. So I just take a little bit off the edge here. Now it's important to know not to cut off the whole root base, otherwise it will not have enough uh, to grow. So it'll, you'll just have some, just pieces of celery. So here I've just cut off a little bit to get that nice uh, fresh white piece of the vegetable so it can suck up the water and grow. So just like our green onion, we, we put our toothpicks in to kind of hold it above water and this does go right into the celery. So again, more in like a triangle pattern, about the same height. Again, it's very forgiving, so don't worry too much about it. And there I have that. So then I take my cup and I place that in there. And then again, I'll fill it with water. Now this one is important that you do not put it in too much water, otherwise it can tend to rot. So you just wanna cover the base of the celery here. And this is ready for a nice bright windowsill. So I'll show you, this is about seven to 10 days old. We have, it's starting to grow right here in the center. It does take a little longer than the green onion, but it's fun to watch, so just stay patient with it. Again, changing the water every one to two days to keep the fresh water in there. Our last vegetable is our green leaf lettuce. Uh, we use green leaf lettuce quite often, um, so we go through this quite a bit. So same concept, we want to cut down to the root here and please be careful with that knife. And we will use this for sandwiches, salads, or for our guinea pigs. It will not go to waste. So I have a pretty wide base right here, so I will peel a little bit off, um, just so it fits in my cup nice and we don't have any issues there. Again, none of this will go to waste. We will definitely be using this. So I will take my three toothpicks again, just like the celery, and I will put it right in a triangle pattern to hold it nicely in the cup. Now this isn't very straight, that's okay. It's very forgiving, so don't worry about that. All right, so I will take this and I will throw it in my cup, just like that, and we're ready for water. All right, so I filled this with water again, uh, just like with the celery. Um, you do not want your water to come too far up, otherwise it can tend to rot, and we definitely do not want that. So just so the base of our lettuce is nice and in the water so it can get those nutrients. Now this is ready for our windowsill again. 
and seven to 10 days, we will have a little sprout here. These are so fun to watch because it'll start coming out the center and you'll see little bubbles like it's growing and it's just really fun. Uh, my kiddo and I really enjoy watching these things grow. So that is our green leaf lettuce, green onion, and celery tutorial on how you can regrow these in your kitchen uh, with very few supplies and it's fun to do. Uh, take care. I hope you have a great day and stay safe, stay healthy.